The views and opinions expressed in this podcast by the host or the guest do not necessarily reflect the views of Paranormal Buzz Radio or its sponsors. Use of any materials produced by Paranormal Buzz Radio without express written consent is strictly prohibited. For information on everything Paranormal Buzz Radio has to offer, visit our website, ParanormalBuzzRadio.com. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Listener discretion is advised. Now. Shut up and sit down. Where do we come from? How did we get here? These are the questions plaguing mankind since the dawn of time. Questions religion, science, and speculation have all tried to answer. Join us as we delve deep into the mysteries of our own origin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another fun-filled Action Pack Adventure with Matt and Benji <coughs> on Origin, where we talk about the origin of all things. How's Matt doing Good. tonight? <laughs> I'm doing great, thanks, Neil. I am doing wonderful. It's been an incredibly, incredibly busy past few weeks, but life happens, and hey, here we are. So Absolutely. The, the the busyness is one of the reasons that we're doing these pre-recorded sessions because honestly life has gotten so hectic that I cannot guarantee my availability on a Monday night anymore. It is crazy when you have you, you go from having just two kids to suddenly you have five kids and all of these different uh activities and everything that they're involved in and life just goes crazy. <laughs> But I tell you what, I would not have it any other way. I wouldn't. Awesome. Not at all. Uh, anyway, so continuing with our last <coughs> excuse me, uh, episode where, unfortunately, I was ill, so we could not do the episode in between. Uh, going off of our last episode where we were talking about the uh, Inca Empire and whatnot, uh, we are going to continue that later in this episode, with the religious beliefs of the Inca Empire. Uh, but first, of course, we have to add in our new segment. Today, on News of the Weird, I have a couple stories. I can't remember. Matt, did you say you had a story or no? I do not. You no. do not have a story. So I have, the, I have today's stories for News of the Weird, <laughs> he, right here on Origin on Paranormal Buzz Radio. All right. So, first story. This is all coming from the Huffington Post. So if you ever want to look at it, go to HuffPost.com and look up the weird news. It is amazing the amount of things you find on the Huffington Post. Okay. But here's what we got <coughs> today. Squirrels did totally nuts thing to a car. All right. This is a story by Lee Moran. All right. Squirrels squirreled away more than 200 walnuts under the hood of a car in Pittsburgh. Holly Persick said she smelled burning while driving her Kia on Monday. Well, that's because you drive a Kia. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we we do not brand preference at this station. I just want to to, to specify that um, no no brand preferences at all. Uh, anyway, she popped the hood and discovered the critters had been storing their food for the winter, which they had taken from a walnut tree in her yard. They'd been storing it around the engine. 
Uh, the animals had also padded the hood with mounds of grass. Now, <coughs> this in, in my head, the, the, this person's vehicle had to have been sitting there for a little bit, I would think. Either that or you had a ton of squirrels working diligently to, to pack away all these nuts and, and fill it with grass. All right. It, it, it's, it, the story goes on to continue. They were everywhere, under the battery, near the radiator fan. Uh, that came from her husband, Chris. Uh, the stash of walnuts on the engine bo- block were black and smelled like they were definitely roasting. <laughs> the couple pulled out most of the nuts themselves. Mechanic at the local garage removed even more. Enough to fill half a trash can. From areas of the engine, the Persix couldn't reach. The vehicle was <laughs> otherwise undamaged. Oh my gosh! I uh, think they were moving in. It, yeah, yeah. If you could see this picture here that I'm looking at, you would definitely think that. Uh, Chris Persick issued a little PSA on Facebook following the discovery. Long story short, if you park outside, do yourself a favor and check under the hood every once in a while. Um, my truck may have had a squirrel chew through, uh, pull out a few, a fuel injector hose and hollies looked like they were storing up for the next three winters. Uh, he added, was obviously or was absolutely nuts, no pun intended. But they show a picture of the hood, and it basically you can't see the motor, you cannot see the engine. It is nothing but grass and walnuts. That Dude, is that's... all that is there. <laughs> that is all that is there. It's quite hilarious, actually. Looking anyway, uh, probably not so hilarious for them, but uh, no, probably not. From our end, it is quite hilarious looking. All right. In continuation, our next story. Painting cows to look like zebras has a surprising benefit. Painting stripes on cows can be amusing, and it has serious advantages for cattle and humans, according to a study. Scientists in Japan have discovered a clever way to reduce the need for using pesticides on livestock. And the evidence supporting it is pretty black and white. Apparently, Josephine Harvey is one for puns. Because that is who wrote this story, just so you know. Once again, on the HuffPost. A study published in the journal... P-L-O-S-1, I have no idea what that is, uh, found that painting zebra-like stripes on cows significantly reduced attacks by biting flies, providing a means of defending livestock against flies without pesticides. The study's inspiration came from past experiments that suggested the striped coats of zebras and the black and black and white surfaces in general attracted fewer flies than the solid black color of the Japanese bovines that were studied. Flies are less likely to land on black and white surfaces due to the polarization of light, which impairs their perception, according to the study. Researchers found that the zebra-painted cattle were bitten nearly 50% less than solid black animals. And then they show a picture of the cow. And <laughs> it looks quite amusing. It really, really does. I'm kind of curious what they... I should go through the story here a little bit more to see. Um, not going to tell me it doesn't look like. But I was hoping to find out what kind of paint they're using on them. To, <laughs> and <laughs> if the paint itself is actually safe. You know, that, that could be a thing, no. you know. Right. Paint absorbs into the skin, and then all of a sudden, now you have a sick cow from paint instead of flies. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, well, according to this, fly bites are more than an annoyance. The insects interfere with cattle grazing and feeding, increased fly repelling behaviors, 
like foot stomping and head throwing and cause cattle to bunch together, which increases heat stress and risk of injury, researchers said. Fly bites are estimated to cost the livestock industry five or five billions, just in general, billions. I don't have any idea where the five came from. Billions of dollars every year. Hmm. Uh, this work provides an alternative to the use of conventional pesticides for mitigating biting fly attacks on livestock that improves animals' welfare and human health. In addition to helping resolve the problem of pesticide resistance in the environment, the researchers wrote. I still want to know what kind of paint they're using. Is the paint Probably safe not. for the animal? Hmm. Or are they using Dollar General spray paint? Ooh. Right? Nope. I hope not. That, that would not be good. No, definitely not. That would not be good at all. All right. <clears throat> we are a little over 11 minutes in. We should probably get started talking about our actual topic. Uh, once I close out of all of these tabs and move on over to this tab. We are working on talking about the Inca religion this week. And I'm going to be reading some excerpts here from a man named Mark Cartwright um, who published this paper on the Inca religion back in 2016. All right. <clears throat> so religion for the Incas was, like many cultures back then, uh, inseparable from politics, history, and society in general. All right. All facets, all facets of the community life were closely connected to the religious beliefs, from marriage to agriculture to government to burials. Success and failures of any kind in life were due to the influence of the gods and the Incas' ancestors. Keeping these figures content and avoiding their wrath in the form of natural disasters and such, like drought, earthquakes, was extremely important purpose of religious practices. Uh, the Inca religion was also an important tool for the ruling elite, if you will, to legitimize both their own privileged positions within Inca society and to spread the general belief of Inca superiority over the subjects of their vast empire. So, some of the religious figures, the some of the some of the the, the deities that they worshipped. I know Matt, you have some of that information. You want to go ahead and share some of that. Sure. I mean, we, they had multitudes of uh, deities that they prayed to. Uh, you had Veracocha, who was the supreme god. Uh, he was the one that created the earth, the skies, the other gods, and humans. Then you had Inti, who was the sun god. Uh, pretty much the emperors of the Incan empires, they were supposedly descendants of Inti. Uh, then you had Mama Quilla, who was the goddess of the moon. She was the goddess of marriage and defender of women. She was married to Inti. Then you had a whole bunch of others. You had Pacamama, who was the goddess of earth. She was responsible for farming and the harvest. Supe was the god of death and ruler of the Inca underworld called Uka Pacha. And um, one thing I want to note, uh, you brought up the fact that uh, Mama Quilla and Inti were mm -hmm. married. Uh, one other interesting fact about Mama Quilla, uh, the Inca believed that lunar eclipses occurred when Mama Quilla was being attacked by an animal. Hmm. 
So that's fairly interesting. I want to make sure yeah. I throw that in there because that's just fun. That's fun information because you think about this. Now we have all this scientific, you know, research of, you know, how eclipses happen, why it happens, yada, 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 the rotation or of, of the, 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 the revolution of the moon around the earth versus the, the, where it's positioning is with the sun and blah, blah, blah. And you look at these ancient religions, these older religions. This one isn't even really considered an ancient religion. This is actually more so an mm-hmm. older religion. Um, right, but you look at their religious beliefs and how they felt like lunar eclipses were caused by the gods in some way, shape, right. or form. So, I mean, that is <coughs> it's just one of those things that's interesting to think about, I guess. Um, well, also, a lot of the tribes that they conquered, the Inca. Uh, allowed them to keep worshiping their own gods as long as it's a tribe agreed to worship the Inca's god, god as supreme. And they held religious festivals every month. It may be to Mama Quilla, It might be to the god of corn. It could be, you know, it all depends on the time of the season also. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Pretty cool. Uh, sometimes they held uh, human sacrifices. Ooh. Would be part of the ceremonies. Uh, they mostly sacrificed children because they thought children were more pure forms. Mm-hmm. And um, some of their mountain peaks actually still have mummified remains of human sacrifices. Uh, they can be found today. Oofta. Oofta, mm. oofta. Um, yeah, you brought up earlier Inti, the, the sun god. Uh, yeah. Uh, worshipped in the temple of the sun, basically. Uh, but uh, Inti was the most important Inca god even though he wasn't the supreme god, but he was the most important Inca god, as he was the god of the sun and the patron of empire and conquest. His home of plenty was also the destination in the next life for those who lived good lives in this in this life. So you, you're, you live a good life, you follow what yeah. you're supposed to do, you're going to go to Inti's home of plenty. Okay, that's the concept here. Uh, the Inca king or ruler was considered divine and a living descendant of Inti, like you mentioned, legitimizing the Inca divine right of rule. A gold statue of Inti uh, represented as a small seated boy and known as Panchao was also kept in the Temple of the Sun at the Coracana, Coracanca, Coracancha. I can't, I cannot pronunciate the word. Uh, the sacred complex at Cusco. Okay. It's kept at the sacred complex at Cusco. We'll go with that. Uh, with rays projecting from his head and decorated with gold jewelry, the stomach of this figure was used as a receptacle for the ashes of, of the burned vital organs of previous Inca kings. Yummy. Nice. Uh, Each day the statue was brought outside of the temple to bask in the sun. Uh, Following the Spanish conquest, the figure was removed and hidden, never to be found again. So, too, the gold which covered the exterior and interior of the Temple of Sun, all 1,400 kilos of it, was spirited away by European invaders in in addition to Coracancha. Inti had the temple fortress complex of Sakashuhaman. Yeah, dedicated to him, located just outside of Cusco. So you got a temple complex at Cusco and then another temple complex outside of Cusco. That's what we're going to go with on this. 
uh, the well-being of the king and the Incan Empire and the guarantee of a good harvest were entirely in the hands of Inti. The god was served by a dedicated high priest, the most senior religious figure in the Inca world, who was aided by a team of young virgin priests. Uh, each major Inca town had a temple to the god, and a vast amount of resources were dedicated to him. Even land and herds were reserved especially for Inti, and a whole province near Lake Titicaca was set aside <laughs> for him. Sorry, my little 12-year-old just... Yep, 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 yep. I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it. Uh <laughs> And then he went one step for, further where a maize field complete with life-size llamas and shepherds was constructed out of pure gold and dedicated to the sun. So that should tell you how important Inti, the sun god, was. I mean, that's that's a big deal right there. I don't even get I don't, I don't even get a real llama let alone you know, a <laughs> llama made out of gold. <laughs> I'd even take a baby llama, but then I'd have baby llama drama, and I don't want baby llama drama. No, you don't want little baby. <laughs> I don't want baby llama drama. Llama drama. Uh, <laughs> one of the most important ceremonies in worship in in the worship of Inti was the eight to nine day Inti Rami, held every June which was the winter solstice for them, uh, on a plain outside of Cusco. Sacrifices were made, libations of water and beer were offered, and all the nobility and priesthood participated in a lavish festival of feasting and singing, which also marked the beginning of the plowing season. Another important festival in honor of both Inti and Viracocha was the Capac Uca. When all towns across the empire were expected to send one or two of their good-looking children to be sacrificed at the ceremony in Cuzco, and in the subsequent possession uh, procession in pilgrimage to various important sacred sites across the Inca world. Death by strangulation or having their hearts removed. That's how that, that's how these sacrifices were made. Death by strangulation or having their hearts removed. And this offering was believed to guarantee the continued well-being of the ruler of his people. I feel like this is almost kind of like the idea of the Hunger Games. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have to send two of your best people from your village <laughs> to die. And it sucks. <laughs> You, you look at these ancient religions or these older religions that did this, these societies that did this, thinking that, I mean, that was probably an honor for them. Right. You know, they, they probably, as scared as they were, I, they had to have been scared. I'd be terrified to send my children, any of my children, out into doing something like that. That is just, to me, that is horrific. But back then, to these people, this is, this is the norm. This is the norm. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is something that... It was eventually going to happen. And maybe they even honestly fought over who was sending them as in they wanted to be the one to send type thing. Or their child wanted to be the one to go. Because they were raised in such a way that led them to believe that that was an honor. Well, that and also they many of the chosen chosen was uh, from conquered provinces. Provisions. Mm, this is as also part true. of a uh, regular taxation. Yeah, pretty much blood money. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, that is also true. 
Yeah, they even used the uh, the chosen woman from the Sun Temple as sacrifices. Mm-hmm. Yep, this is also true. This is also true. But we are nearing the end of this episode, so we will be back. <coughs> Hopefully in a couple of weeks, um, to continue our discussion on ancient civilizations and older civilizations. I'm not 100% sure that we're going to continue too much further into the Incas, but there there may be a little bit more to delve into. If we do, it might just be a finish up, a wrap up, and then we move on to other things. But we've pretty much covered the gist of their religious background and beliefs really yeah yeah i mean they they practice mummification that yeah was something that they did they practice mummification um they basically were eliminated in the they basically fell uh out of favor with the communities outside of Cusco. And yeah. ultimately over time, they just pff, see ya. We're done with you. And with the arrival of the Spanish, it kind of just died. Sealed off the deal. On them. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, I guess we're going to call this an episode and we will see you all hopefully in a couple of weeks. And have fun. Hey, everyone.